Today in lab, we're going to be looking at something that has a really fancy name, no matter how you try to say it. And that is, we're going to be looking at quantum mechanics. And remember, quantum mechanics for a chemist discusses how the electrons in an atom relate to the nucleus of the atom. So what we're trying to figure out is if the nucleus is here, how far is each electron away from the nucleus? Not only that, but we need to talk about how far, what shape, or is, is it a sphere? Is it a dumbbell? Is it a four-leaf clover? Is it a, a dumbbell and a donut, which is one of the shapes that you get on later on, and uh, so on, okay? And we also need to talk what direction does that shape point in space, and we need to talk about how many electrons are in there, and it gets to be a really complicated subject. Uh, luckily, we have Schrodinger who figured it all out for us with Heisenberg and, uh, you know, Einstein and De Brol and a whole bunch of other, other people, especially the Manhattan Project, because at least something good can come out of tragedy. Um, we're going to not actually do quantum mechanics in this first part. We're going to look at one of the effects of quantum mechanics, and that is that because every atom has a different number of protons in the nucleus, it pulls on its elect each atom pulls on their electrons slightly differently. And that means that even if you have two species that are isoelectric, which is a fancy word you're going to learn in the next couple of weeks, which means that they have the same number of electrons in the same locations, even if that's true, they're going to have different atomic emissions spectra. Those uh, orbitals uh, that the electrons are in are going to be different distances away. And because of that, it's going to take different wavelengths of light or different amounts of energy to promote or to demote an electron. So what we're looking at today is we're going to excite a bunch of electrons. And then we're going to allow those electrons to relax back to their normal space. And then when that happens, they're going to give off wavelengths of light as photons or particles of light, but it's not a particle, it's a wave, but it's acting like a particle, but particle wave duality. Don't ask, it's complicated. Anyway, what we're going to find is that for each metal, each metal has its own distinct uh, colors and wavelengths that it gives off. And that means that we can use uh, this emission spectrum as a fingerprint for a metal. I can look at the color that a metal is going to burn and identify it because it's not going to look like any other metal. Now, caveat, some of these metals look very, very similar to each other. And on video, I don't know that they're going to show up. The differences are going to show up very distinctly or very well. We're going to do what we can. Caveat number two. If you are colorblind in any way, shape, or form, any sort of uh, atypical color vision, you're going to need to get someone to help you with this. We're going to be looking at very fine gradations of color, and that can be problematic for some people. I know I personally have problems seeing the differences between some blues. They just get too similar for me. And that would be problematic in this case. So get a buddy to help you differentiate these colors, especially uh, yellows and oranges and reds. There are lots of them. Uh, and especially blues and purples. There are several of those that are gonna be kind of hard to tell the difference between, okay? Now, the way that we're going to do this is the good old fashioned way of playing with fire. Now. Uh, we're talking about metals, but remember that a metal by itself, uh, you can't just like go outside and light your car on fire. Like that's not going to work. Uh, you can't just light a spoon on fire. Okay. So what we've actually done is we're going to take salts. Okay. Of some metals. So here I have a barium salt. Now barium salts are incredibly dangerous. Barium itself cobalt, copper, really any of the heavy metals are incredibly dangerous. So it's really good that we're doing this online, okay? Uh, and what we're going to do is they're, they're all paired with a chloride ion. Uh, that's important. Chloride ions don't have any relaxation wavelengths in the visible range. 
So all the color that we're going to see is going to be coming as a result of the metal itself. Second, I can't just light a salt on fire. I mean, you can't just light table salt on fire. And that's essentially what this is. So we need something called an accelerant or a fuel or uh, an ignition source. We're going to use good old fashioned methanol. Problem methanol here, is a methanol is toxic to humans. Production of ethanol, uh, it causes blindness in high doses. Uh, luckily, we're not drinking it because that would be faster to cause this. Instead, we're going to use it as a fuel source, as an ignition source. It happens to burn readily, just like ethanol does, just like most liquors do. So uh, it also burns cleanly. Its only products are uh, carbon dioxide and water, which, you know, we can handle that. We have lots of that around us and a little more isn't going to hurt, okay? Uh, the problem here is that carbon and oxygen do have, uh, and hydrogen, all have emission lines in the visible spectrum, but, uh, they all tend to be very close together, and they all tend to be in the bluish range. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a uh, methanol fire next to our fire that has methanol and the salt in it. Anything that looks like the methanol fire, you need to ignore in the salt fire. Uh, it's going to be this blue tinge. Uh, think of it as the same color blue that comes out when we use a Bunsen burner, because it is. Remember, Bunsen burners are burning natural gas, which are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and a little bit of sulfur containing compounds. And methanol is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So uh, the fires are going to look very, very similar to each other because nitrogen and sulfur have very few lines in the visible spectrum as well. So I, can't see this in the light. So the way we're going to do this is I'm going to set up a series of evaporating dishes that have ethanol and our salt compounds in them. And I'm going to burn them one at a time and show you each individually. We'll also include a series of pictures if you have a hard time or you lose track. Uh, I will announce what compound or what metal we're burning. And then at the end, I'm going to give you the opportunity to identify two unknown compounds from their flame spectrum. Now, safety. We're going to have a Bunsen burner by our side to do our ignition. We're going to have a watch glass, a large watch glass, uh, available to snuff out fires. We have a fire extinguisher on hand very quickly, and Dr. Seal has agreed to stand by with the fire extinguisher should I set myself on fire, okay? Uh, we're also going to use a pair of uh, crucible tongs to move these things around because fire's hot. I don't wanna use my hands to do that with, okay? So we're gonna turn off the lights. We're gonna start the fires. You sit back and start making your observations. now. The kinds of observations that you're going to make are not just color, but what the fires look like. Some of them sparkle. Some of them whoosh with great big flames. Some of them, the fire, the color only appears at the very edges of the fire. So be very descriptive. Be very proactive in making great, amazing observations, not just, it was red. Okay? Don't tell me it was red. Tell me it was vermilion. Tell me it was scarlet. Tell me it was rose colored, but that it also burned brightly. Uh, it took a while to take hold of the burn. It sputtered out easily, whatever else. Make very good observations here because it's not just the color that's important sometimes. Now, again, we're gonna turn off the lights and let's start the show. So as you can see, I've got my crucible tongs and my damping device ready at a moment's notice. You'll also notice that I've got my fire source ready. And I would tilt my screen so that you could see the fire extinguisher, but eh, you can look at that. Okay, it's right here. Right here, and he's got it pointed at me. It's not fun. There it is. Okay. Now, I'm going to start by showing you just a methanol fire by itself. So, there's our methanol fire. Now, look, that is extremely similar to this fire, isn't it? These fires are a whole lot alike. And that's because they contain the same components. 
carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. This one has a little bit of sulfur and nitrogen in it. This one doesn't, okay? Now, let's bring in our first sample. I'm gonna scrooge this over. Remember, ignore everything that looks like this. In our first sample, we're going to have a barium salt. Now, barium's highly toxic, so I'm gonna light this and step away, okay? But I am going to give you ample time. I'll put my hand back here so you can see. Okay, to put this fire out, we're gonna use a damper. We're not gonna blow it out or anything stupid like that. And we're gonna be careful about backdraft. We don't want it to reignite just because we're reintroducing oxygen. Okay, so that was barium. Next, we're going to use calcium. Now, the problem with calcium compounds is that they tend to pull water towards themselves they're considered hygroscopic. So we've got to prepare this one fresh. That also means that it's going to take it a little longer for the calcium color to show up. I will alert you when the calcium starts to burn and not just the methanol. So it's starting early and good. And again, we're gonna dampen that. We're not gonna just blow it out or anything stupid. Again, notice how I'm not using anything on my body to touch these once we've started adding, once we've added heat to it, because that's fire and it hurts. See? Now I've got a cobalt compound. Now, First off, this is really interesting in and of itself because this particular cobalt compound is um, very, very brightly colored. Uh, it's typically a, a purple color, but when we put it in methanol, it turns to a bright blue. So cobalt has lots of pretty colors going on with it, but now let's see what happens when we set it aflame. This is another one that may take a second. Oh no, it's gonna do it right away. I don't know if you can see this very well, but it looks kind of like a sparkler. The, um, the little embers of it are very, very sharp and distinct whenever you get really in close to look at it. So it looks almost like a sparkler is going on instead of just a normal fire. Okay, let's put that one out again. Uh, 
there's another interesting one that comes in here, and that is our copper compound. Look at it, it's a very interesting lime green, kind of yellow browny color in the water itself. Uh, copper compounds tend to be green. Think of patina that you see on like the Statue of Liberty or on rusted copper. Uh, they also tend to be very brilliant blue or very, very bright green. So there's quite a variety of copper complex colors out there. Let's see, however, what it's going to do in the fire. Oh, we run out of methanol on our methanol fire so that you know what to ignore. Okay, so there's our methanol fire and there's our copper fire. Uh, copper fire is fun because uh, a little bit of history here. It used to be used for practical effects in uh, stage and film stuff, but uh, dangerous, so they stopped. Uh, but you can still sometimes go back and see uh, not so much video recordings. They didn't use it a lot in Hollywood, but there's lots of tales in theater of copper fires for uh, things like Macbeth uh, or Scottish play, uh, if you're a theater nerd. Uh, or uh, even uh, sometimes with things like Marlowe and even later, uh, even up into the modern era, until we stopped using fire on stage. Really. Let's turn that one out. Next, we're going to do potassium. Now, I'm going to go ahead and warn you, potassium is very difficult to see. So we're just sort of hoping that it's going to show up on video right now. Uh, the nifty thing about a potassium fire is that if you're in person, it's actually two colors, okay? There is this orangey yellow color that you see sort of at the edges of the fire. But if you look down, especially into the lower parts of the fire, uh, that's not that same cornflower blue that we're getting over here. It's more of a lilac or lavender, uh, violet, purple color. Uh, it's on that end of the spectrum. Don't know if we're seeing that so much on video, but that is what's happening. We get a two-colored fire with potassium, with the orangey yellow and that purple that's coming through it. Uh, that's because those colors are relaxing at different times. That's really all that's happening. You'll notice that the purple is towards the inside and the yellows tend to be on the outside. It's just a time difference. So, our methanol fire is going to stay off. There's a lot of water residual in here, so I'm not going to be able to get it to ignite again. Just remember that pale blue that you're seeing up here in our Bunsen burner flame is that same color, and to ignore it. Okay. Uh, now I've got sodium. What's cool about sodium is that it's been used in street lamps for hundreds of years, 200, 300 years, uh, because it glows a very distinct color. It glows for a long time, and with just a little bit of fuel, you get a very, very bright, bright, bright color. What's cool is that if you burn a sodium fire under a sodium lamp, the fire appears black because the uh, waves going out and the waves going in, you just, you aren't gonna see those at the same time. So you get what's called a black flame. That again was an old, old thing they used to do in uh, theater and practical effects uh, to really, really creep people out. Out. 
else. Now, our last sample before we do our unknowns uh, is another pretty dangerous ion. It's strontium. Uh, strontium is way down at the bottom of the first, sec first second column. <laughs> All of the chemists are trying to remember the periodic table, second column. Uh, and so it's going to have some really, really big effects going with it. This is the one that usually gets the most oohs and ahs. This is another uh, one of these fires that's had some historical significance. It's the only one of the, the elemental fires that has been given an official name. So uh, if you want to go and look up what, a, what this particular color is, it's actually named vermilion, B-E-R million. Uh, it, it, this is what vermilion paints aim to look like. So uh, it's been important not only in the world of chemistry, but in the world of art. Uh, and again, it was also used as a practical effect on stages, no matter how dangerous and deadly it is. Okay, those are all of your standards, so you know what they look like. Let's now start delving into the world of unknowns. I'm going to light this complex, this compound, which is actually a nitrate, not a chloride. Uh, it's not going to matter though, because nitrogen and oxygen's, uh, uh, their elemental lines, their atomic emission spectra uh, look much like this. Uh, there's apparently some sodium still in the air, so we're getting a little yellow tinge on that one now. But uh, that blue flame, so we're not going to really miss, not have, you know, we're not going to do any major corrections here. But I want you to tell me which metal is acting as a cation to this nitrate compound. Time's up. And let's look at one more unknown. I, again, this is a nitrate, and I want you to tell me what the cation, the metallic cation is for this nitrate compound. Okay, time's up for that one. And now let's go back to your professor with more details and uh, some more of the paperwork on this.